I'm Jane Goldman, and I'm investigating the paranormal. Tonight, I'm trying to discover the truth about aliens. Perhaps there are aliens disguised as people. If their technology is very good, we simply would not know. We're all too familiar with eyewitness accounts of UFO sightings and alien abductions. We've all seen the blurry photographs and the wobbly home videos that claim to show flying saucer activity. And we're all aware of the assertions by the believers that there's an official cover-up in operation. So I was determined that this investigation was going to be more ambitious. I wanted to find out if there was any hard evidence of any alien activity here on Earth. So I headed across the Atlantic to America for my first case. 5,000 feet up at the edge of the Rocky Mountains in the American Midwest is the border between Utah and Colorado. It's a place with a few small towns and huge empty areas of sparse desert. It's also an alien hotspot, an area where it's common to hear reports of sightings. But one man's story is different from all the rest. I waited on a lonely road on the Colorado border where I'd arranged to meet Bob White. He was a man with a unique story. Bob had promised to take me to the spot where his alien encounter had happened. Bob White was a successful country singer touring the USA. One summer night, he was driving to Las Vegas with a girlfriend. At about 2 a.m., they crossed the border from Utah into Colorado. Then, just up ahead, they both saw what seemed like a huge and brilliant light beside the road. Bob persuaded his girlfriend to pull over, even though she was terrified. Bob got out and walked up the dusty slope to try to discover the source of the light. But when he reached the top, the light became so intense that he had to shield his eyes. And at that moment, whatever was causing it took off at high speed and shot up into the night sky. That all sounded like just another encounter, but the thing that made Bob's story different was that whatever had caused the blinding light had left something behind when it took off. Bob had found a piece of physical evidence to back up his story, and that made his case unique. She and I were driving this uh, road, it was late at night, so at two o'clock in the morning or three o'clock in the morning, it was very, very dark. This is, this is pretty close to the spot right here. This looks like it. There the light was, up here. And it was as huge as a three-story building or a, a large barn. And it just so bright you couldn't look at it. I had to shield my eyes like this to look at it. Couldn't tell if there was anything solid inside it or not. And we were standing here and the light was shining over the top and I couldn't see the bottom of it and uh, I thought well I'm gonna see these big halogen lights and I'm gonna see mining equipment uh -huh. but there were no halogen lights and there was no mining equipment and as we were watching it it just straight up in the air just as fast as my eyes could follow it and then it connected to two other lights like two blue neon tubular lights with a space in between, and then went out of sight. And then I watched it, and I saw it come back down again, and I thought it was the same thing coming back at me. And I saw it where it hit the ground here. When I followed the light, the ridge in the ground, this is what I came up with. No, that's extraordinary. So this just came out of the big light? Yes, it did. 
Did you touch it right away? No, it was glowing hot. I nudged it with my, my, with my foot. Right. I went back to the car to find something to pick it up with. Yeah. I sure wasn't going to leave it here after I saw it. Or by the time I come back, it had cooled down. So right away, you felt you were right in the middle of something right. extraordinary. Actually, it happened so fast that uh, I didn't have much time to feel anything, except that I knew that something hit the ground, and I wanted to find out what it was. And my first thought when I saw this was, gosh, this is part of history. So I picked it up, took it back to the car, put it in the trunk, and we were on our way. The object Bob had recovered from the UFO encounter was made from some sort of metal, but felt much heavier than it looked. It was strangely beautiful and like nothing else I'd ever seen before, but I knew if I wanted to find out more about the object and its origins, it was going to have to be scientifically tested. Back in the car, Bob continued his story. After their encounter, Bob and his friend drove to Cisco, the nearest town about 15 miles further south. Since that night, a freeway has been built that bypasses Cisco. Now that the main road no longer passes by, the town that Bob and his girlfriend visited has become a ghost town. This was a cafe. This was where we stopped to get a cold drink. There were two prospectors sitting at the table. They overheard us talking because we were both pretty excited about it. And they come up and ask us, you folks saw something tonight, didn't you? And I said, yeah, we saw some lights. I didn't tell him about the object. And he said, did you report it? And I said, no, I didn't. I don't know who to report it to and why would I? He said, we see them here every night. And he said, we report them and they don't investigate. Maybe coming from an outsider, they may investigate. And I said, well, I wouldn't know who to tell. And he gave me a phone number. He said, call this number. The number he dialed was for the nearby Green River Air Force Base, which is known today as the New Area 51. But the duty sergeant who answered the call seemed unimpressed with Bob's report. He blew me off. He said, well, what you saw was probably some reflections of headlights or uh, swamp gases or, or, or ball lightning. And uh, he wasn't interested in it. So I wasn't either. Did you tell him about the object? No. Why did you not tell him? Because I didn't want anybody to call me a UFO nut. Right. That's why, because my career was going real good. The object remained with Bob's sister while Bob concentrated on his singing career. When she died in 1998, Bob rediscovered the alien object and decided he now had time to investigate it further. After the break, I meet the experts who believe alien scientists are using our farm animals for their experiments. Sometimes the ear's gone, the tongue's removed, glands, yeah. eyes removed. Bob White had had an amazing encounter which had left him with a unique piece of physical evidence. In the years since Bob found the alien object, he had not gone public because he was uneasy about the reaction of others. Even now, it was important to him that we believed he was telling the truth, so he suggested undergoing a polygraph lie detector test to prove that his account of events was accurate. Scott Stoneburner carries out lie detector tests for the state police department and he performed the test on Bob in his motel room. Hey Bob, I'm Scott, polygraph examiner. Nice to meet you, sir. Polygraph tests work by monitoring small changes in the heart rate and breathing rhythm that are caused by the stress of telling lies. In America, they're regularly used by police departments for testing suspects' alibis. That's about as tight as it's going to get right there, Bob. Is that, is that, is that Yep. Is that comfortable? Yeah. Sure. Okay. Scott went through the standard interrogation procedure which involved asking the same simple sets of questions three times. Is your last name White? Yes. 
Before 1980, did you ever lie to a person in a position of authority? No. Regarding the object you found near Grand Junction in the 1980s, do you intend to answer truthfully each question about that? Yes. Regarding the object you found near Grand Junction in the 1980s, are you lying about how you found that object? No. Okay, Bob, I need you to sit quietly for a few more seconds. This third test was over. After the test was completed, Scott let me know that there had been no significant fluctuations in Bob's heart rate or respiration, which meant that according to the polygraph, Bob had been telling the truth about how he found the object. After the polygraph reconfirmed Bob's story, I needed to switch my attention to the object itself. First step would be to find somewhere that could tell us something new about the object. I knew it had undergone several tests already. It had even been examined by the government at the Los Alamos laboratory, but all the tests had been inconclusive. But things aren't always the way they seem. Bob was told by the government that their tests didn't come up with anything that suggested an extraterrestrial connection. But they have kept part of the object with no explanation. If it's just an ordinary lump of metal, why did they decide to keep a sample of it? It's the sort of behavior that fuels conspiracy theories. While I was considering the problem, I got a call from one of Bob's colleagues who told me he had some documents that I might find interesting. Dr. Gilbert Jordan had at one time been a scientist working on classified US government projects. He showed me his Area 51 security pass, and he'd also obtained some military papers that seemed to suggest that Bob's object might not be unique after all. In 1944, as World War II came to a close, a British Spitfire flying over Germany was shot down by what seemed to be a UFO. The pilot was killed and the plane crashed in Denmark. Inside the damaged plane, they found a metal object very similar to Bob's. These are actually uh, pictures that are come off the uh, Army Fort Belvoir website. So this is an extraordinary document. This is War Department official business. This is an official document that was released under Freedom of Information Act. Yes, and this is from the Counterintelligence Corps. This is the first uh, time that I ever heard that there was an aggressive action by a Foo Fighter or a, a UFO. When they recovered it, they saw a great big gaping hole in the Spitfire. And the only way it could have been produced is like a shape charge would hit it. And then at the, in the back of the plane, which they found which was crashed, they found an object. And the object was approximately the same size as Bob White's object. The color was slightly different. It was kind of a copperish, uh, titanium type hue to it. But it had the same type of chads that uh, Bob White's object had. The documents Dr. Jordan had found were remarkable and seemed to prove that the government had seen at least one other object like Bob's. The military had apparently decided their object had an alien connection. So why not Bob's? Or did someone know something that they were trying to hide? It was a difficult and slow process, trying to find an open-minded scientific institution prepared to carry out the new tests on Bob's alien object. While I waited for responses, I decided to search for evidence in Britain, in an area where, according to some theories, the action of the Earth's magnetic field has created a 40-mile-wide UFO corridor which stretches from Whitby in the east across the Pennines to Liverpool in the west. Todmorden in Yorkshire is one of the most active areas in Britain for claims of alien visitation. Like Colorado, it's a center for sightings, but also for what's become known as animal mutilation. According to some, these seemingly random and unexplained attacks on farm animals are connected with alien activity. Sheep farmer Sue Ryder has suffered a series of sheep mutilation incidents on her farm. My family's farmed here for over a hundred years and never had anything like it. So what happened that morning? Well, a sheep obviously dead with part of its face missing 
and totally cleaned out inside. Um, the tendons were totally intact. It was a constant cut all down the face and right angles along the jawline. There was no ripped skin, but it was the, um, the precision of the cutting which was quite amazing. And the depth of the cut was the same the whole way along, all round by its ear and its eye, tongue, everything was missing within that. But there was no, no wool, no blood. We looked at it really in amazement, in, you know, that it, something like that had happened overnight. And you think about a fox and the badger. Yeah. Um, and obviously it wasn't that because there was no tearing. What do you think did it? No idea. No idea at all. Can't think of any animal that could have done um, done the injury. And um, I'm open to suggestion. When Mrs Ryder discovered the dead sheep, she contacted an organisation called the Animal Pathology Field Unit, who advertised in the Farmer's Guardian. Run by a retired scientist, David Caton, the group examines mutilation cases all over Britain. They say there's a pattern to these mutilations that rules out the notion that they're the result of random predator attacks, and in fact suggests a systematic experimental program carried out by visitors from another planet. There's usually about five or six type of things that happen on a regular basis, a repeated pattern if you like. And the most common thing is the jaw strip, exposing clean bone. Sometimes the ear's gone, the tongue's removed, usually from the back. Glands. Glands. Yes. Eyes removed, and the ears crop down to the scalp, which is a common thing. So yeah. this would be a typical case? Typical case, yes. There was no other injuries on the animal. The, other than the, the head, the, the face and the jaw. Right. So we're talking about clean cuts here, that's what you're yes. looking for, is yes, it? Yes, generally clean cuts, yeah. Slaughtermen say to clean bone down, so clean jaw, I think the best case is probably, yeah, this one. To get the jaw clean like this and to peel the skin back, mm. uh, they, they say normally you would need steam, you know, high heat. You've managed to draft in uh, medical professionals to give their opinion as well, I understand. Yes, certainly one gentleman who was, I'm very lucky that uh, he was showed interest and was willing to do it. He's a professor of pathology and he looked at six lambs uh, which he couldn't identify the cause of death, but he knew the animals were actually dead before the mutilations took place. He identified in some cases a knife, a, a thin blade had been used to separate the vertebrae to take the head off and the blade had gone through the what they call the IV joint in the in the spine, the intervertebral disc uh, and uh, it had precisely cut through that position without you know that making damage. I was shocked at what Caden had said. It certainly seemed that the removal of the head from the spine with such surgical precision would surely require medical training and controlled laboratory conditions. So did he feel that it had been caused by an individual with some kind of medical skill or...? Well, obviously he would have to have a medical training to have done it. Uh, it would be very impractical to carry out these sorts of procedures in an open field without a firm base and good lighting and because they often tend to disappear at night or they're found first thing in the morning so it suggests it's an overnight operation but then for someone, a human being, to have done that, to take the animal away and perform these sort of ritualistic type wounds, some people might say uh, and then return the carcass back to the scene of the crime, doesn't make any sense, particularly that they're quite remote regions of these places are fine, quite difficult places to get to in a vehicle. I'm going to ask, I mean, if we're to take on board the hypothesis that this is being perpetrated by people from other planets, is this what we're talking about? Mm. Um, why? Uh, I've thought for a long time it's to do with uh, monitoring for pollutions, which is to suggest that they're looking at uh, the uh, contamination we are occurring on this planet due to chemistry we apply into the fields, fertilizers, 
that's the animals ingesting. Apparently they can tell a lot from the health of the animal by looking at tongue tissue. But they're obviously examining life on this planet and they're looking at all life forms and we've had mammals, mutilated seals, dolphins, dolphins birds, even the predators. Chillingly, Caton said he had evidence of these kind of experimental injuries being found on all kinds of species, not just farm animals. But I wanted to know if there had ever been a case where a human corpse had been found with the same kind of telltale mutilations. And I was shocked to discover a case that was virtually identical. On September 29th, 1988, the body of a man was found near to the Guarapihangua Reservoir, which supplies water to the Brazilian city of Sao Paulo. The corpse was taken to the local pathology lab, where a post-mortem revealed that most of the man's internal organs had been removed seemingly through small holes in his body. His face had the same jaw strip removal that I'd seen on the photographs of the mutilated sheep, and his eyes, ears and tongue had been removed in a way that also mirrored the evidence that Caton had shown me. If this man had in fact been a victim of an alien experiment, then we had far more to worry about than the fate of a few farm animals. My investigation continues after the break when the search for evidence of alien experimentation on humans brings me back to Britain. I'd been shocked to discover a human case in Brazil that involved the same mutilation injuries found on livestock David Caton claimed had suffered alien experimentation. But then I discovered a suspicious death right here in the UK, which many people, including police officers, claim has an alien connection. On a sunny afternoon in June 1980, 56-year-old miner Zygmunt Adamski told his wife he was just off to the corner shop in the village of Tingley near Wakefield. As he left his house, he waved to his neighbour and set off down the road. That was the last time anyone saw Adamski alive. He just disappeared completely for five days. When he did turn up, it was 30 miles away in Todmorden, and Adamski was dead. His body was discovered lying face up in pouring rain at the top of a 30-foot high pile of coal in a delivery yard. How he got there and where he'd been for the past five days was a mystery. The post-mortem gave the cause of death as heart failure, but it could not explain how Damsky had received the strange injuries to his body. There were a series of unusual circular burn marks on his head and neck. These burns had been covered with a kind of gel. The gel was sent for analysis, but the substance could not be identified by the forensic scientists working on the case. After hearing about the Adamski case, I returned to the village of Todmorden. My earlier visit here had focused on the evidence of animal mutilation, but this time the victim was human. Alan Godfrey, the local policeman for Todmorden, was one of the first officers at the scene where the body was discovered. He was baffled by the case evidence. Well, the question it does is, why would a man disappear off a street some 30 miles away from where he was found, go missing for five stroke six days, he'd eaten and he'd shaven, his shirt was missing, no identification on him, his hair had been cut very short, and the burn marks on his head and at the back of the neck, that wasn't self-inflicted. I contacted the coroner who had presided at the Adamski inquest. He'd returned an open verdict and in his letter confirmed that this was a very unusual case. The coroner had not ruled out murder and many questions about Adamski's highly suspicious death remained unanswered. Despite this, Godfrey was told not to investigate the case any further. He didn't think about it again until an incident early one morning when he was out on patrol. I myself was uh, driving a police car or something caught my eye two or three hundred yards further up the road. At first I thought it might have been a bus that had gone sideways but whatever it was it, it, it distracted me from going where I was going to go so I decided to go and have a look at it. As I started getting nearer and nearer I realised that 
this object, it wasn't a bus, because this object was huge and it was uh, hovering off the ground, it wasn't actually touching the ground and it was just hanging there, it, it wasn't making any noise or anything the trees at the side of the road and all the bushes were all shaking and all the dead leaves were coming off, off the road and swirling round and I noticed the, the, the bottom half of the object was rotating got on the radio straight away uh, I couldn't get any response at all tried the car radio again nothing at all so I'm sat there I've got the blue lights going I've got the well, hazard lights going I'm parked right in the middle of the road I, I don't know what to do I mean I just sat there PC Godfrey got out the notepad that all patrol cars carry for recording traffic accidents and started drawing the craft hovering in front of him. I started to draw it and then there was this, uh, I could describe as a big flash. It was bright white. The next thing Godfrey realised was that he was seated in his car, driving along a hundred yards further down the road. The policeman spun the car round, but the craft had vanished completely. Had he somehow been transported from standing beside the spinning craft sketching into his moving police car, or had he suffered some sort of memory loss that had wiped some aspect of the encounter from his brain? And when I got to the police station, the inspector called me into his office and we got in there and he said, uh, I want a report off you. And I said, yeah, are you kidding? He said, no. Three policemen in Halifax had had an, an encounter. It's amazing, really. Corroborating <laughs> your story. Well, it even gets better. Two police officers in Littleborough, again at about five o'clock, I sat up there, and over in between two pylons is a diamond shaped object. So you've got one, two, three, four, five, six police officers, actually, in the space of 20 minutes, have seen an unidentified flying object. So six police officers who are highly trained in observing and recording evidence appear to have all seen the same UFO. That seemed unusual, but then I met Detective Constable Gary Hesseltine, who has, for several years, kept a record of hundreds of police UFO sightings. The database now is about 100 to 110 cases involving about 300 officers, which I think is a, is, is, a, is a powerful body of evidence. These are highly qualified people, well used to reporting what they see. Hesseltine had drawn his own conclusions about the Alan Godfrey case, its links with the Adamski death and a cover-up. When you join the police or you join the military, you sign the Official Secrets Act. Alan had already signed them, and yet he was told to sign a piece of paper, again, the Official Secrets Act. Initially, Alan was of the opinion, well, why do I need to sign it? I've already signed it. When they turn over the piece of paper, it said, you are not to talk about your own sighting from November, but you're not to talk about the Zygmunt Adamski case. Now, I would argue that if there wasn't a UFO link before, I think it's fair comment to say that there is one by that act in itself. Because if the Zygmunt Adamski case was not UFO related in any way, why would you bother to get him to sign something which was just a sudden death? During my investigation, I'd seen some amazing things. I'd held a metal fragment that had allegedly fallen from an extraterrestrial craft. I'd seen evidence of animals apparently used for alien experimentation. I'd even come across murders where, according to some policemen, the prime suspects were from another planet. Were all of these things really going on under our noses? And if so, why wasn't it front page news? Was there a cover-up? Official denials and cover-up accusations just fuel the sheer number of conspiracy theories. And getting drawn into that world wasn't going to get me anywhere. I needed a reality check. So I decided to go and talk to the people who spend their lives watching the skies and ask them if they had any hard evidence of alien activity here on Earth. Jodrell Bank in Cheshire is Britain's biggest radio telescope. Since the mid-90s, the telescope's been involved in the Project Phoenix search for radio signals from intelligent extraterrestrial life. This is the, the, the world's third largest telescope of its type, uh, so you don't do a lot better than that. Uh, we could pick up a mobile phone from the surface of Mars, for example. How likely do you feel it is that there is intelligent life out there? When people first started trying to 
estimate how many other civilizations there could be in our galaxy, the Milky Way, they had numbers of 100,000 to a million. To be honest, nowadays we're not nearly so optimistic. Some people suspect that at this particular time we might well be the only one. But more optimistic people might say there could be tens to perhaps a hundred. But that does mean, on average, they'll be spread quite widely through the galaxy. And as yet, we haven't really looked very far. But by about 20 years, 2020, something like that, we'll have new and much bigger radio telescopes capable of probing the whole of our galaxy. If there is intelligent life out there, how likely is it that we will be able to communicate? Well, theoretically, it's totally possible. However, I do believe they would have to want to communicate to us. Um, some people say that there's been radiation from television transmitters and the like leaving the Earth for the last 40, 50 years. Uh, and in principle, if you weren't too far away, you could pick that up. It's not very easy. It's much more likely that we would pick up a signal that someone is deliberately aiming at planet Earth, or at least our sun. On March the 8th, this unusual signal was received. It was passed to linguistics expert John Elliott, who's the world's leading expert on decoding language. If I play that for you... If aliens do attempt to contact us, Elliot is the man who will be called on to make sense of the communication. I did analyse it, look at the structure of this uh, analogue waveform, which it is. Um, and it's interesting, uh, that it's not random. As you can hear from just listening to it, there's something going on there. There's got a rhythm to it, to it. Actually, is there any way of clarifying then where it did come from? Will we ever know? What you can do is look at the signal, um, look at the data, the structure of it, is it interesting, which this one is. Um, it certainly looks like it's come from an intelligent origin. Uh, but it could be one of our own satellites, of course. Uh, it is very strong signal, so if you were going on logic, you would err on caution and think, well, due to its strength, it may well be one of our own. Um, it's going to have to come millions of light years. And a transmitter to actually send such a signal out so we receive it at that sort of strength would have to be far beyond what we've got. But then again, the likelihood is the civilization will be far more advanced than us anyway. So is it possible that we might end up with an exciting result just by ruling out? Mm. Yeah, yeah. We could go through a lot of processes um, and if we cannot confirm it, anything terrestrial, then there's the big question mark left over it. So if scientists are searching for alien transmissions and decoding any possible communication, was it possible to imagine what visiting aliens might look like? I asked Professor Jack Cohen, the author of Evolving the Alien. From an evolutionary point of view, how feasible are the kind of descriptions we hear of aliens? Oh, I think that they're really very stupid, actually. The, normally, people who claim to have seen aliens say, oh, they're very much like people. They're these teardrop-shaped creatures. What makes the common image of an alien so unrealistic, then? Because it fits our prejudices and our fairy stories that we've heard about and the, the things we've seen on the media and there's nothing at all to do with the creatures that are on, that live on the planets of other stars. I mean, would an alien life form necessarily be recognisable to us? Our brains are adapted for recognising vertebrates. We recognise faces, knees, elbows. We recognise living things. We've got a special bit of our brain that remembers living things. It's different from the bit of the brain that recognises stones and so on, or faces. We have different bits of the brain that are specialised. Perhaps Perhaps aliens are here, and we haven't got a bit of the brain that recognises them. Perhaps they're exploiting this. They will certainly have very advanced technology. If they have come between the stars and are visiting our planet, their technology would be a lot further on than ours is. Perhaps there are aliens disguised as people, so that in, if their technology is very good, we simply would not know. <laughs> So according to Professor Cohen, theoretically aliens could already be here, among us, watching our every move. 
we just might not be aware of their presence. It's an unsettling thought, but only conjecture. I needed to get back to the one piece of concrete evidence I had, Bob White's object. I discovered a science professor at Mesa State University who was interested in seeing what had been found. Bob and I traveled together to the professor's home in the desert. Bob has the object with him. Mm -hmm. There it is. Well, for crying out loud. You ever seen anything like that before? Similar, but not like this. Uh, it's unbelievable, it really is. See, this looks like an ablation ring here. Yes. Uh, do you understand what I'm saying? The, yes. These particles were melting yes. and being brought back this way and redeposited into the tail. I'd like to look at this under the microscope and see if it's, um, if it's crystalline. I'd really like to see that. It's the darnest thing I've ever seen. Where'd it come from? Out of the sky. Where did you find it? <laughs> uh, near Cisco. We agreed with Professor Fandridge that we'd bring the object along to the university for testing the next day. In the meantime, Bob's team had been carrying out more of their own tests. Nuclear physicist Dr. Gibbons wanted to show me a strange effect caused by the mysterious piece of metal. So, uh, you've got the object here. What's this? Uh... This is a very sensitive electromagnetic field meter. And we discovered uh, just a few months ago that the object is giving off an electromagnetic field. Uh, you notice that there's no lights lit up. Uh -huh. And as we bring this up to the object... Wow. That is curious. Well, a, a, a normal piece of metal wouldn't do this. The alien object did seem to be more than just a hunk of inert metal. But the professor then revealed another surprise when the team had simply placed the mystery metal object onto a piece of x-ray film like the type used by dentists the alien object had exposed the film without any of the equipment which is usually necessary electromagnetic radiation and maybe one of the x-ray revealed the object was not the same all through and that there was a strange double inner core it's a real genuine exposure 48 hours and it matches the idea that there's two parts to the object it's like the core of the thing. Right, it's, it but it's emitting, kind of... it's emitting a beam, a very, very uh, high energy beam. Could, could it not just be that the core of it is some kind of well, radioactive we think, material? We think that the, uh, in, these, in, the, in the, what we call the humps is some sort of a power unit. Was there some kind of power unit hidden inside the metal? And if so, what was it for? After the break, we put the alien object under the microscope and find out what it's made of. Since Bob White first told me the amazing story of how he'd found the strange metal object, I'd been repeatedly surprised by new revelations. The fact that the US government apparently possessed a similar metal object, classified as alien, kept coming back to me. Did someone already have the answers I was looking for? Our object was going to be subjected to an electron microscope scan and other tests that would reveal what it was made from. I hoped that these tests would also tell us something more about where it had come from and importantly if it was just a hunk of metal or a complex piece of alien technology. Later that morning at the State University, Mr. White and his whole team arrived for the test on the mystery object. It was time to go to work. Inside the lab, Professor Fandrich and his colleague, Professor Duget, prepared the sample for examination under an electron microscope. It was capable of giving very detailed 3D images of the structure of the object, magnified up to 100,000 times. The sample would also undergo EDS, a technique that uses X-rays to reveal its main elements. The peaks that we'll see will tell us the primary elements that we can find, the major elements, not the, not the trace elements necessarily. Would each of these lines on the graph represent a different element? If the element was there, yes. When it makes a peak, like you see that uh, tall green peak to the left, yeah. I'm 
pretty sure that's probably your aluminum. Yes, it's aluminum. Okay. okay. And uh, I see another piece. Aluminum, and then there's a small little peak right here. It looks like silica. Right, and it uh, looks like iron's coming up, maybe. Uh, iron. Magnesium might be coming up. Manganese is also in that general area. Uh, titanium, I know there's some titanium, but maybe not enough for the EDS to locate up. I right. have a little bit of nickel here. Now that's interesting. Nickel iron, when you find anything that's just pure nickel iron, it's probably uh, an asteroid related object. Nice. Pure nickel iron. Like uh, a lot of the uh, iron meteorites that we find are nickel iron. Uh huh. Huh, sodium, K and K2. Looking at this, this is a very clean spectrum. <coughs> this is going to be aluminum with traces of magnesium and, uh, or manganese and iron. Now some of the rocks we have from space that we know are extraterrestrial have almost exactly the same chemistry as we find on Earth. Okay. Really? Well, you have to realize yeah. the Earth is in space too. Yeah, of course. <laughs> we forget that so easily, don't we? So what do these melt checks tell us? That the aluminum had been mobilized, heated to a minimum of about 575 degrees centigrade, and that it was in an airstream. It wasn't in a vacuum. It had to be an airstream. And the airstream was moving or transporting or forcing the liquid uh, aluminum to move toward the tail. Can you think of an example of something that might be manufactured that would use all those elements? Yeah, this uh, alloy is what's called a 360 aluminum alloy, which is actually a fairly common alloy because it's very strong. It's uh, easily molded into parts. It's a preferred alloy. So it'd be used for making component parts of, of what? Of an engine or a casting for a, maybe a handrail. I mean, just almost anything that right. you could imagine that you might use aluminum for. My favorite scenario right now is that it was it's a manufactured object. It was a piece of something that was either, either explosively or some other way introduced into our atmosphere at extremely high speeds. The introduction in the atmosphere could have been at two miles. Right. It could have been from space. I just know that it was seriously damaged by heat friction in an atmosphere. Right. Probably this atmosphere. The tests revealed something very important. This was not a natural object from something like a meteorite. It had been manufactured, though we still did not know where or by who. That was one fact that might one day lead to understanding what Bob saw in the desert. I've lived my life honestly, and never have I ever been called a liar until this happened to me. People do judge you. If it hasn't happened to them, it hasn't happened. I'm the only one in the world that has any inkling of an idea of what it is. What do you think it is? I. In my mind, in my heart, I'm sure it's from another planet. During this investigation, I've come across some compelling evidence for which it's hard to find a straightforward explanation. But I'm lucky to have been investigating this subject now. Advances in science mean that I've been able to discover far more than I would have found out, say, ten years ago. It's impossible to prove conclusively whether aliens have or haven't visited our planet. However, I do believe that thanks to work begun now by scientists, we will one day soon understand the truth about what's happening on our planet.